Thank you for joining us for part three of our series, Evaluating Ecosystem Services with Remote Sensing. My name is Amber McCollum, and I am joined by my colleague Juan Torres Perez and our two guest speakers today, Mehdi Harris from the Hunter City College University of New York and Austin Troy from the University of Colorado, Denver, who will focus on projects around valuing heat mitigation and rainfall interception. So as a reminder, uh, for this training, we have three sessions. This is our last and final session here um, on August 30th. Um, here's the course website where you can find all of our webinar recordings, the PowerPoint presentation, and now the homework that is available for you to complete uh, via Google Forms. At the end of each session, we will have a question and answer session where we will display your questions and transcribe the answers on a document that we will make available about a week after the session is complete. If you have additional questions that are not answered in our Q&A session, you can also follow up with myself at, our, at my email address listed here or my colleague Juan. I do also want to recognize that we have folks from around the globe joining us today. Um, so feel free to introduce yourself if you'd like. Um, and also feel free to ask your questions along the way, and we'll be cataloging them and get to getting to them at the end of the session. So as we've mentioned throughout this series, there's one homework assignment, um, which will be submitted via Google Forms. It's now available on the course website. You have two weeks to complete the homework um, by Tuesday, September 13th. And if you'd like a certificate of completion, you must have attended all three webinars and complete the homework by the deadline. Then it takes us about two months or so to get all of the um, certificates out to everyone. So do please be patient with us as we catalog those and send those out. So keeping in mind that this is an introductory course, we do still recommend a Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, we've included the link to um, that training here, or having an equivalent experience in um, the basics of remote sensing. And again, I've listed the um, course website here where you can find all of our materials. So for this session, we are going to highlight multiple projects across the world where ecosystem accounting is being conducted with the use of remote sensing data. These include examples from Liberia, Uganda, Indonesia, across the US with coral reefs and urban environments. So as a review from last session, remote sensing can be used to assess a variety of questions related to the valuation of ecosystem services. There are many types of models and methods for assessing the value. The ARIES technology highlights interoperability and allows models and data to be contributed by independent researchers, hosted on a network, and automatically assembled into model workflows. And the Natural Capital Project aims to improve upon the well being of people and our planet by motivating targeted investments in nature with a focus on science, technology, and partnerships. So let's get started today with a really great example in Liberia related to the um, GDSA, the Gaborone Declaration for Sustainability in Africa. So as a reminder, GDSA is centered around the role of natural capital in development by bringing the value of natural resources from the periphery to the center of all economic decision-making for multiple African countries. The project that we'll talk about today is a collaboration with Conservation International and NASA. With the long-term goal of developing decision-making tools and practices based on satellite observations of Earth that can be used worldwide. This Liberian example is one of multiple projects being supported by CI. This project supports GDSA activities by providing tools and approaches to advance Earth observation applications for natural capital accounting, or NCA. 
The focus is to develop a low cost, replicable approach and tools that countries can use for ecosystem extent mapping. Liberia is a country on the West African coast and has a population of around 5 million and covers an area of over 100,000 square kilometers. Liberia holds some of West Africa's last intact forest and one of the continent's best remaining habitats for threatened species, such as the Western chimpanzee, the forest elephant, and the pygmy hippo. Liberia is also less densely populated than many of its neighboring countries. Together, these factors have created an opportunity for conservation unparalleled anywhere in Africa. But there, there are some challenges. Many uh, Liberians, um, nearly 63%, live under the poverty line and suffer from food insecurity. Over 70% of the population is dependent on forests for their food and livelihood. Bushmeat is still commonly consumed, even in the city, and is a primary source of protein for many rural people. Without electricity, most Liberians rely on wood or charcoal for cooking. Along the coast, fisheries provide protein and income for a large proportion of people. And mangrove ecosystems along Liberia's coast provide fish, fish nurseries, as well as shrimp, crabs, and oysters that sustain local communities. They also stabilize the coastline, reducing erosion and slowing floodwaters. So Liberia's government is really focused on ways to meet food, income, and energy needs of the people, ideally in a sustainable way that is in line with the sustainable development goals. So natural capital accounting plays a really key uh, role in this. The pro-poor agenda for prosperity and development is the Liberian government's primary strategy to foster sustainable and equitable growth. This strategy seeks to promote sustainable, transparent, and well-managed use of Liberia's natural resources. Like most governments that adhere <clears throat> to the statistical standard of the UN system of national accounts, the government of Liberia collects data to describe the country's economic performance and form the basis for calculating the GDP and other standard economic indicators. However, the indicators within such national accounts are limited to the production boundary of the economy and thus <clears throat> do not measure progress towards achieving sustainability um, within these objectives. So incorporating natural capital into the national account will really reveal the impact and dependency of economic activity on the environment and support better economic decisions in the long term. So this can help the country's decision makers better understand the impacts and trade-offs of development decisions, in particular in these types of forests. In 2016, a team of scientists and staff from Conservation International and the government of Liberia conducted a pilot project to identify a map with which ecosystems are essential for sustaining human well-being and economic activity in the country. They were defined as globally significant for biodiversity and as sources for fresh water that are the sole supply for population. They also outlined wild sources for food that are safety nets in periods of crisis, and natural places that are really important for cultural identity. So from this work, some of the key findings included that the project generated a range of maps showing highest level of essential natural capital. You can see one of those maps here. Like most essential natural capital for biodiversity, carbon, and freshwater ecosystem services, um, these things in Liberia are mostly in still intact. And they also identified a multitude of management strategies um, that are needed to ensure the flow of benefits from natural capital and to ensure that that's sustained in the long term. So 
So in order to, to ensure the sustainability, the team created ecosystem classification uh, using up-to-date maps of ecosystem distribution at the national scale. And here is where the partnership with um, Conservation International and CI really took hold. Uh, this work really centered around this um, creating processes that can be repeated at low cost um, and be a useful tool for other countries that are conducting this ecosystem mapping. So this approach generates information on land use and ecosystem distribution, enabling the implementation of both land, extent, land and extent accounts from 2000 to 2018. So here you can see um, an example of uh, one of the, the land cover maps produced here. In order to create the ecosystem extent map, here is a schematic of the methodology used. To create the land use land cover map, Landsat 8 and several ancillary data sets were used within a random forest model. Random Forest is a well-known image classification algorithm that can be implemented by Google Earth Engine. And we have a previous RSET training um, on the use of Google Earth Engine for classification. And I also mentioned this in session one, so you can find the link to that training there as well. For the plant dissimilarity map, the CI team used species distribution data and biogeophysical data like temperature, soils, and topography within a generalized dissimilarity model in the R software. So the GDM is a technique used in prediction of comp compositional dissimilarity in ecosystems. So the use of Google Earth Engine really leverages the advantages of cloud computing to provide users with a single place for accessing satellite data, for applying the methodologies and displaying the results. Google's access to data storage and computing infrastructure allows the platform to host large remote sensing data sets and to provide access to global imagery archives. In the application programming interface or the API, users can easily apply algorithms for things like land cover mapping. So this is the um, tool that was really beneficial and used extensively for the um, land cover mapping within this project. So here you can see the image of the land use land cover map that was generated for 2015, which had an accuracy of 83%. You can see that the, a large portion of the land area is mature forest at 55%, with secondary forest making up 25%, and sparse or degraded forests making up 17% of the area. And then these other land cover classifications are um, much smaller percentages. So you can see that um, the mature forests are largely intact in this region, as we mentioned previously. So here is the map result from the ecosystem distribution model. Here you can see large portions of the Southeast having a lowland ecosystem with biannual rainfall and an annual rainfall regime in much of the Northwest. Um, so this is the, the map that was produced with the um, ecosystem modeling using the R software. So then the final ecosystem extent map where both of these things are combined um, simply overlays the aggregate values from the two input maps. So here you can see there's a, an abundance of mature tropic rainforests that are lowland, montane, or pre-montane, along with many other types of ecosystems identified. So this was really um, integral to identifying um, where these services are and um, also looking at um, the ecosystem extent um, in these regions. So the team is also really focused on creating training materials to outline their methodology so it can be applied in different regions. And this includes an introduction to Google Earth Engine and a supervised classification tutorial. There may even be the opportunity for a more advanced training um, connected to this within the RSET model um, next year. So 
do stay tuned for that as we um, consider this as an option. With that, the next phase for accounting in Liberia is a um, project funded focused on conservation and sustainable use of Liberia's coastal natural capital, which launched this past summer. And this is really focused on implementing ecosystem accounting in coastal regions. And it will identify innovative financial financing schemes for conservation and management in the, these regions. And as I mentioned, the coastal ecosystems and the mangroves are really important um, to the, um, the ecosystems and the livelihood of people in the region. So with the implementation of the CAEA, this could be a means to support Liberia's long-term sustainability and green growth while alleviating poverty and human well-being towards achieving those objectives I mentioned in the pro poor agenda. Most immediately, the results of the accounts can inform the goal of protecting 30% of Liberia while also allowing the information on natural resources and cost of degradation to be taken into account in development decisions. So this can help in, um, by including decisions around impact assessment, um, interventions, climate change adaptation, spatial planning, and many other things. This also aligns with um, the work that the country is doing uh, with the sustainable development goals. Um, as well as things like the um, Global Biodiversity Framework and the Paris Agreement. Um, so this also connects to how the country is um, identifying their um, national um, contributions for the um, Paris Agreement and can assist in um, looking at climate mitigation strategies, and um, decreasing things like carbon emissions um, in the region. So it, act, it, it does have implications towards um, identifying climate change mitigation activities as well. So the maps, the land and extent accounts that were generated through this partnership are a really important step forward um, to better informing policy and decision making in Liberia. Um, and the Environmental, Environmental Protection Agency of Liberia um, has been leading much of these efforts and will work towards the country's implementation of the CAEA to foster development of information, data, and knowledge sharing for monitoring. So with that first example, um, we will now move on to another example from Uganda that's aligned with the EO4EA initiative that we highlighted during our first session. So this project aimed to rapidly develop the required underlying spatial data infrastructure and the compilation of key ecosystem and biodiversity related accounts using that CAEA framework for Uganda. And this was a collaboration between many groups um, that you can see listed here um, and was work that was completed um, in collaboration uh, across um, many of these networks. The accounts that were identified were land cover and ecosystem extent, as well as three non-timber forests and focus on two flagship mammals, the chimpanzee and the elephant. And I also want to mention that the link for the project report is included on this slide. So you can get all of the details about this report and the folks who, who collaborated on it in using that link there. So the policy applications for this work included to inform ongoing debates surrounding um, protected areas, to make the case for increased budget allocation and investment in biodiversity rich sectors for conservation and management, to establish the extent of ecosystem degradation and where declining biodiversity threatens the delivery of ecosystem services for economic growth and human well being, 
to increase awareness and appreciation of biodiversity as a natural capital asset among decision makers and the public. And then also to assess progress towards um, Uganda's National Biodiversity Strategy Plan and National Development Plan, as well as associated other um, international commitments. The various accounts outlined in this figure shown here were determined in discussion with stakeholders in Uganda. And the first stage in this process was to construct accounts of the extent of land cover class for 1990, 2005, 2010, and 2015, using land cover maps produced um, by the National Forest Authority. Using this information, accounts have been created for the extent of natural and non-natural land cover based on aggregations of relevant land cover classes. With these aggregated accounts in place, accounts of ecosystem extent have been compiled by intersecting areas of natural cover, cover for these time periods with a distribution of the original extent of vegetation. Finally, species accounts describe the extent of suitable habitat for individual species, and these have also been compiled. For the non-timber forest product species, um, this has been achieved using um, expert knowledge to identify um, key species with discrete vegetation classes. And then the accounts were constructed again for the same time period um, of 1990, 2005, 2010, and 2015. For the flagship species accounts, IUCN and historic data um, on area of occupancy have informed maximum potential range of these species. Habitat preferences for the flagship species proposed by the IUCN have been matched to suitable land cover classes to generate those accounts for the same time period. And I also want to mention that the um, um, NSIM modeling platform was used to um, support this project. So here is a map of land cover that was generated for 2015. The maps were generated for this aspect from 1989 to 2005 using the National Biomass Study, and then from 2005 onward using the FAO land cover classification system. So here you can see much of the region is um, subsistence farmland with multiple other land cover types as well. One of the key ecosystem changes identified was substantial reductions in the extent of natural ecosystems, particularly for forests with 29% remaining and moist savanna with 32% remaining. These losses will impact the delivery of a broad range of ecosystem services and on ecosystem resilience, including the ability of the landscape to adapt to things like climate change. Another important finding that has policy impl impl implications is that the protected area estate has performed really well at preventing the loss of natural ecosystems and the benefits they confer. So you can see here a map of some of these protected um, regions. With respect to wildlife watching tourism opportunities, the a large majority of the remaining fully suitable chimpanzee habitat was protected in many of the, the regions. And this provides opportunities to also identify target areas for future protection and for tourism development. For elephants, a large majority of fully suitable habitat is protected in um, the western and southwestern portions of the country. And there also is substantial area that exists with outside the protected areas that could be useful for habitat. For the African cherry, the protected area estate has also been effective in um, covering the remaining, remaining highest quality range for this species with 89% of the extent for the um, areas of this species within the protected regions. 
And there is also um, a lot of opportunity to continue to conserve these areas, as well as looking beyond these areas um, to ensure um, species biodiversity and species richness within these regions. Large areas of potentially suitable natural vegetation for harvesting non-timber forest products were also identified. Specifically, there are opportunities for developing areas for sustainable habitat for um, shea butter and um, gum aerobatic trees for nuts and butter production that are not in conflict with the protected areas that we mentioned as well. So in terms of policy implications for this work, regular updates can now be assessed in a timely manner for trends and extent of natural ecosystems and the impl implications for key species. This methodology will assist reporting on a range of policy commitments, and some of those are shown here. And there are opportunities for improving these accounts in the future. So now we will highlight a WAVES project example from Indonesia. As mentioned previously in session one, the Wealth Accounting and the Valuation of Ecosystem Services, or WAVES, is a World Bank-led global partnership that aims to promote sustainable development by ensuring that natural resources are mainstreamed in developing planning and national economic accounts. Indonesia's economic growth is strongly linked to agriculture, where forestry and fishing contribute to 11.4% of the GDP, and this development is heavily dependent on natural resources. In 2017, the Ministry of National Development Planning, in cooperation with the World Bank and several development partners, introduced the Low Carbon Development Initiative for Indonesia to explicitly incorporate greenhouse gas emission reduction targets into the country's national medium-term development plan, along with other interventions per for preserving and restoring natural resources. As the new platform for Indonesia's development, this allows governments to understand ways to maintain economic growth while minimizing exploitation of natural resources and keeping emissions low. Technical assistance provided by WAVE provided SIA compliant data that could be used for systems dynamic modeling via this um, land um, development initiative. So data from natural capital accounts on land cover extent, as well as peatland provide, provided to be useful in running the models that informed these um, development initiatives. The models analyzed the carrying capacity of the natural system under different growth scenarios and showed how growth could be constrained by the limits of natural capital to provide ecosystem services. For the land cover mapping portion of this project, many different data sets were used, including Sentinel-1, PALSAR, and Landsat-8. And you can see a schematic of the Im image classification workflow in the image here on the right. You can also see a real color composite of the um, generated mosaics for um, some of the regions here on the left. And this is from 2017. And these data were used for multiple uh, needs, but also uh, really importantly to create a land cover map from um, 1990 to 2014. So here's one example of a land cover map from 2014, and all the maps are available at resolutions of 30 meters, um, similar to Landsat. And here you can see much of the region is, prim is primary or degraded dryland forest or cultivation, with some other land cover types like shrubs and savanna, um, but much of the region is cultivated land. Here are some of the key takeaways from the Indonesia land account that was generated. The land account displays the changes in land cover over time, differentiating between the main land cover classes 
um, in Indonesia, such as the perennial crop, plantation forest, natural forest, urban area, and open water. The main type of land conversion that has been found during this time period is from forest to plantation, including both perennial, such as oil palm, and plantation for it, forest for pulp and paper products. The amount of perennial crops and plantation forestry may be significantly underestimated in official statistics. So Indonesia has lost about 33 million hectares of its natural forest, about 17% of Indonesian land area from 1990 to 2014, based on these um, land cover mapping efforts. Perennial crops, which are currently dominated by oil palm plantations, were rapidly expanding from 1990 to 2014. And the land cover change really does vary depending on the different island groups identified and studied. Here are some of the key takeaways from the extent account. The ecosystem extent account focuses on providing information on the use of land and ecosystems rather than the land cover. For instance, a distinguishing feature of the ecosystem extent account when compared to the land account is that different types of perennial crops so things like oil palm or coffee are identified. So these crop types indicate different economic outputs of the ecosystem and crop type also influences other ecosystem services, things like carbon sequestration or water regulation. And they also influence the income level for local people and the pressure exerted on the environment for each of those different crop types. So the amount of water used, um, pesticide or fertilizer used. It's also really relevant to separate these crops for the compilation of income and production accounts as part of the system of natural, national accounting. Um, so this is another layer to a better understanding the types of ecosystems and the services they provide and how um, those can better be implemented and accounted for in the national account. Okay, so now um, with that example, we're going to move on to discussing um, another really important ecosystem, coral reefs and the services they provide with some examples in the US. So one of the most important or the important coastal or marine ecosystem particularly in tropical island nations or coral reefs. Coral reefs provide a vast range of ecosystem services. They are among the most diverse and biologically complex ecosystems in the world. Despite covering less than 1% of the world's seafloor, coral reefs are home to more than 25% of known marine species, including plants such as seagrass, different types of algae, invertebrates and fishes and fish of really great commercial importance. So things like lobsters, crab, groupers, snappers, etc. They even um, house endangered or threatened species like sea turtles and marine mammals like manatees, dolphins, and whales. Coral reefs provide the primary subsistence source of protein for many island nations through fisheries. They also generate significant economic and non-economic values as a major source of recreation and often serve as a primary source of income through tourism and other activities. Globally, the total value of the world's coral reefs for tourism was estimated by Spalding et al. in 2017 at 36 billion. In the US, Coral reef-related tourism from direct use is valued at around 551 million per year, with reef-adjacent tourism valued at 680 million per year, with an estimated total of about 1.2 billion in value per year. In Southeast Florida alone, the total ecosystem services provided by coral reefs was estimated in 2013 by a, a NOAA report to provide over 70,000 jobs 
and around $8.5 billion in sales and income. Most likely, these numbers are even higher now um, after almost a decade um, after this report was completed. Overall, the annual economic value of the world's coral reefs through tourism, fishing, local jobs, and shoreline protection is estimated between $375 billion and $9.9 trillion um, from Costanza et al. in 2014. So coral reefs also protect coastlines by dissipating about 97% of wave energy and reducing about 84% of the wave height before it reaches coastlines. The three-dimensional structure provided by the reefs themselves in induces drag on the wave, further causing reduced wave energy to reach the shoreline, thus resulting in reduced coastal flooding. The value of U.S. reefs for flood protection alone has been quantitatively assessed at more than $1.8 billion annually for the direct benefits of avoided flood damages to property. Similar approaches have been used to quantify the benefits of reef restoration across Florida at 232 million and in Puerto Rico at 400 million annually. The present value of large-scale reef restoration efforts across Florida and Puerto Rico, if reefs are considered as natural infrastructure, would exceed about 3.75 billion annually. Because of population growth and climate change, impacts caused by coastal flooding are expected to worsen this century. The US, for example, spends more than 500 million per year on mitigation efforts related to coastal flooding, although most of these funds are um, designated to gray infrastructure, so things like seawalls. In recent years, it has become more and more evident that the benefit of protecting nature-based solutions, such as reef restoration, can really aid in coastal risk reduction. In that, in that sense, um, this, pub this published report um, from, for Hawaii in 2019 and for Puerto Rico and Florida in 2021 really identify the value and the role of U.S. coral reefs in coastal hazard risk reduction. So this figure shows the methodology the authors used to evaluate this role um, at these different places. So we'll not go over the specific details, but in general, they combined six decades of wave data from 1948 to 2018 from the Global Ocean Wave Data Set, which included wave height, period, and direction into 500 different combinations of sea state that best represents the range of conditions for the study areas. These were then propagated to the coastlines using a physics-based wave model known as simulating waves near shore, or SWAN, which simulates the transformation of waves as they approach the shore. Then reef profile data was added based on available benthic habitat maps on coral cover percentage and extent to create a series of layers within GIS. Significant wave heights were then propagated over the reef to estimate the extent of flood with or without the reef. Lastly, using U.S. census data, they estimated the potential impact of a 100-year storm event on the population and the infrastructure. So we'll show um, some of the re results from um, this, these papers here in the next few slides. So these maps, um, show the figure on the left shows in blue the estimated flood extent during a 100-year flood event, assuming healthy coral reefs along parts of the west coast of Maui. The red overlay shows the additional flood extent of the flood beyond the blue range, assuming a one meter of coral reef loss. That is, the region protected by coral reefs during the 100-year flood is in the red region in the map. So the map to the right shows the distribution of people protected by coral reefs from flooding during that 100 year event. So here, the map on the left is the same that we showed on the previous slide, but is now comparing the total infrastructure value in the US 
protected by coral reefs from flooding during a 100-year event. The total protection in both number of people and value obviously depend on the type of structures in the particular areas. So um, whether those structures are hotels or housing complexes, et cetera. But these types of data show the importance of such um, magnificent ecosystems and how their three-dimensional frameworks help in mitigating the impact of wave action during these kinds of events. In general, the authors estimated an expected annual benefit in terms of the value of economic activity provided by housing that is protected by the US, by US coral reefs annually at roughly 700 million and the value of economic activity provided by commercial land, commercial and industrial buildings protected by the coral reefs was about $272 million. So in total, the expected annual benefit in terms of the value of all coastal storm flood protection provided by U.S. coral reefs was estimated annually to be about $1.8 billion, $1 billion just in Maui alone. So here's similar data from the more recent study by the same authors where they applied the same methodology to Puerto Rico and Florida. In some of the areas in Puerto Rico, particularly in the north and east coast, coral reef restoration efforts supported by local and federal agencies, and most times conducted by local non-government organizations. And those have been conducted for decades with the purpose of increasing biodiversity and um, improving the structural health of the benthos therefore in uh, increasing coastal protection. So many of these efforts were heavily affected with um, the passage of Hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017, but those efforts have continued afterwards. The map shows, particularly towards the middle region in the yellow rectangle, that restoration efforts can significantly increase the protection of infrastructure and the people living in those areas. Um, so these are some really important results um, on the impact and the, the usefulness of coral reefs um, in um, the economies of um, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Florida. So now I'm so thrilled to have Mitty Harris from the Hunter City College University of New York and Austin Troy from the University of Colorado Denver with us today who will be highlighting projects around evaluating heat mitigation and rainfall interception. So over to you, Mehdi and Austin. Thank you, Amber. Uh, I appreciate it and I'm very happy to be here. Um, we are going to present some of the uh, results of our work about urban ecosystem accounts. Um, uh, with me here, we have Austin Troy, who was the PI of the project. I'll let Austin to start um, and introduce the project, and I'll uh, take over and I'll just go after that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mehdi. Uh, yeah, this is Austin Troy, um, and uh, thanks for having us here. I'm just going to do a very, very brief introduction to this presentation, uh, and then Mehdi will go into the details. The research that this project is part of uh, is uh, called Earth Observation for U.S. Ecosystem Accounting. This is a NASA-funded project that's ending this month. Its full title is Piloting the Use of Earth Observation Data in Support of National and Subnational Ecosystem Accounts in the United States. Um, and uh, Mehdi and I worked on this along with our co-investigator, uh, Ken Bagstad from the USGS. Um, this project was intended to develop uh, models, methods, and data uh, that would help support national scale uh, ecosystem accounts uh, and accounting. And um, so we looked at a couple of different categories, including uh, pollination and uh, a national model for um, uh, pollination ecosystem services and the accounts generated from that. Um, but here today, we're going to focus more on uh, another part of this project, which was looking at urban ecosystem services and specifically the role of, the, of trees. 
So this ties in well to some things that are happening at the national level right now. Uh, just recently, it was announced um, that uh, there, this interagency policy working group on natural capital accounting and environmental economic statistics um, is being launched. Um, this was uh, an initiative from the White House, um, and it basically provides interagency coordination, work planning, and budget support on national strategy around ecosystem accounting and uh, quantification in, uh, to help with uh, decision making um, that involves natural capital and natural assets. Um, so there's a little timeline here that kind of shows you of what has and what will happen. Uh, but the long and the short of it is that um, this, uh, this represents a, uh, an attempt, uh, an initiative to mainstream ecosystem accounts and ecosystem quantification. So there's a need for these types of tools and these types of data that we worked on in this project. Um, and um, so, uh, and this incidentally does involve, this, this initiative uh, I think um, closely involved the, the, uh, the interagency working group on natural capital, which our co-investigator Ken Bagstaff was part of. So he was very involved in this. Um, and uh, so, so what we're doing right now, we're, we're hoping will inform this strategy and some of the, the tools that, that uh, help support it. So just to uh, uh, reiterate what I said before, the NASA project that this is part of um, looked at a, uh, a bunch of different things, including pollination, and several different kinds of uh, urban ecosystem services. Today, um, Medi's gonna focus on urban ecosystem services that come from uh, urban trees. Now, there's a lot of services that come from urban trees, uh, air quality regulation, biodiversity, habitat, aesthetic value, property values, um, it's uh, even reducing crime. Um, and, uh, but we're only gonna focus on two, uh, two of these today. We actually, these are only, these are the two that we actually modeled in our project, which are urban heat mitigation and stormwater reduction through rainfall interception. Um, so Maddie's gonna take you through the steps we use to develop these tools and data sets uh, on a national scale. And with that, I will hand it over to Maddie. Thank you so much, Austin. And um, yeah, so in this project, uh, we focused on uh, urban areas in the US. Uh, we chose those urban areas that their population was over 50,000 um, and that came about uh, seven, more than 700 cities. So for all those 700 cities, you wanted to see what would be the uh, benefits of trees. For tree cover data, we used national land cover data sets, um, uh, tree cover. Uh, which uh, comes at 30 meter by 30 meter resolution, uh, covers the entire nation, and uh, also it is being updated almost every five years. So this data is consistent in terms of methods and can give us some good um, uh, basic infrastructure to understanding how trees are um, benefiting us. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, explain the urban heat mitigation uh, sub project here. And um, for urban heat mitigation, we are really focusing on the cooling energy savings that trees can um, bring to us. So um, I'm going um, to explain the, how the model works and some of the basically um, uh, basics of this. Uh, what is urban heat? Um, some people also call it urban heat island. I personally like urban heat because um, we, some, in some places it is not really an island. Um, also in day and night we have different patterns. Um, so I generally prefer um, the term urban heat. Urban heat means urban areas are generally warmer than it, their surroundings. There are variabilities here in terms of in different geographies and climates and in different, in different um, hours, day and night, um, uh, but overall, we want to say in average, urban areas are warmer than their surrounding. The data needs for our models are surface temperature, uh, NLCD tree cover, which is national land cover data set, tree cover, uh, NLCD land cover, 
um, and weather station data, some some of the data that we used came from weather stations, building footprint um, data that uh, has the national coverage, and also building energy use data. In, in overall, to understand the uh, urban heat, we need to understand the urban energy balance. And this is complicated, and, and we don't want to go through this, but um, I'll, I'll refer you to this publication, RL, um, et al. 2012, which gives a good, simple um, explanation of what the urban microclimate system is. We have multiple energy fluxes, for example, incoming radiations and um, storage heat, um, sensible heat. So some of these things um, are basically generally they need to be in balance and if you had more incoming energy for example then you're going to have accumulation of heat and that's what really urban heat is uh, here we are really focused on the radiation part of this because um, the way trees in, uh, interact with uh, radiation is that trees will provide shade and this is just everyone understands is that in a shaded area uh, it is a little bit cooler, and that is because of uh, you are not receiving radiation. So when the radiation is not being received at the ground level, um, you are not storing heat at the ground level, and uh, generally you are creating less energy. You are absorbing less energy at the urban canopy layer, we call it. Uh, therefore, uh, the surface temperature in those areas is, is slightly lower, and uh, we believe that lower surface temperature eventually um, will lead to uh, lower ambient temperature. Uh, urban energy the, the budget is, so, is complex, you know, in terms of uh, short wave radiation, long wave radiation, there are many details there. Um, but we here we want to really f simplify this and focus this because we want to run a national model. Uh, we won't be able to do this without simplification. And part of the simplification here is we want to create a simple relationship between trees, surface temperature, and ambient temperature. And therefore, uh, we can model this. Um, so for this, we developed basically a, a national uh, coverage surface temperature. Uh, this map is um, generated from Landsat 8 images. Um, band number 10 of Landsat uh, provides thermal um, wavelength, and based on that, you can create surface temperature. We downloaded uh, between 2013 and 18, we downloaded over um, uh, 1,500 images, and uh, in some places, you, we had multiple images, for example, four, and in some places, we had one or two depending on how many cloud-free days you might have in the summer day uh, in those years. Uh, eventually, we got the median of those numbers and we created the surface temperature, uh, which was a very valuable piece in your work. And uh, you can see how surface temperature could be different in different um, cities. Um, surface temperature is really a function of the surface itself, whether you have trees, impervious surfaces, permeable surfaces, water, um, and other land cover um, categories. So basically, surface temperature um, kind of reflects land cover in some ways. We also used um, weather station data because you didn't want to solely rely on uh, surface temperature. And because of that, we needed to um, download some weather station data. We downloaded the weather station data um, for those years that we ran the model for. And uh, these data come from, for example, minimum and maximum and average um, daily um, uh, temperature. And again, we collected them for the summertime. And um, eventually, all of those data came to a model that has um, two uh, components. I don't want to give you headache by the details of this process, but what I want you to get from this diagram is that our model had two parts. The first part uh, here, uh, so th these are the input data. So well, we had some input um, data, and then the left part of this diagram is a surface temperature, um, basically is a regression model uh, in which 
uh, surface temperature was the dependent variable. And uh, based on, uh, and the independent variable here is the uh, tree cover. So we wanted to know how tree cover can reduce um, or increase surface temperature. Uh, so we get that relationship. And then um, in the second uh, model that we have here, which is the, on the right side of this diagram, you can see that uh, the air temperature was the dependent variable. This time, uh, surface temperature itself was the independent variable. Uh, in addition to surface temperature, we also had a few other variables such as latitude and total building footprint. Um, so we wanted to just understand how landscape in general uh, is associated with um, air temperature. We eventually plugged those two models together and we calculated um, uh, the impact of trees on air temperature. Um, these two models basically give us that. And we also propagated the error uh, using Taylor's uh, method. Um, Taylor here, 1997, they have a really nice book um, on error uh, measurement. And we use that method to propagate the error, meaning putting together the uncertainty of these two uh, regressions together. Uh, and we also use some uh, constant values or some coefficients, let's say, uh, for how much is the cooling impact of, uh, you know, how much is the energy use of the uh, cooling systems in general, in different climates, and um, how much uh, basically trees can uh, reduce um, that energy for us overall. Then, uh, we eventually, outside of this model, calculated how much trees can um, cool um, the air temperature, and because of that, how much we can uh, avoid using cooling systems. And then, based on that, we calculated how much money you can save uh, based on just having some trees in your environment. Um, and eventually, all of those data uh, come together, and uh, we can for each city, uh, we can aggregate those values because our model output was at 30 meter cell size. Um, so we can aggregate those cells and eventually calculate how much overall um, you save some energy um, and therefore you are avoiding spending money um, because of trees, because, have, because of having trees. And then we also normalized that by the housing units. Um, in those areas. So eventually we are uh, representing here how much in different cities, in average people are, um, you know, saving money uh, just because they have some trees in their environment. Um, it, again, it is very obvious that in some cities that you have a lot of trees, you have many, you know, good tree coverage, you are, your saving is high and in some other trees, in, in some other cities that is lower because there's not much tree cover. Uh, and the results overall um, in 2000, so we ran the model for 2011 and 2016. Uh, in 2011, our data shows that about, uh, you know, $500 million is saved um, in the United States um, because of those trees. And in 2016, um, that uh, value is 539. Uh, these are adjusted for inflation, so they are comparable numbers. The second model that I want to talk about is rainfall interception. Trees uh, can regulate the stormwater um, because they are intercepting rainfall. And that slows down the runoff um, at the surface level. In this model, we are uh, using similar, some similar pro uh, data products, which are a national land cover data sets, tree cover, and also land cover. We also use weather station data again, because we wanted to get the precipitation um, at, uh, for each of those uh, areas, the urban areas. Also, we used um, MODIS's uh, seasonality, and um, I don't have it here, uh, but we also use the leaf area index um, uh, for understanding how much 
uh, basic leaf area we have. Uh, leaf area was one of the actually key data sets in this um, project and basically leaf area index tells you how much leaf coverage you have above the ground. Um, if your tree you know, on average is covering the surface by just one layer, so your leaf, leaf area index would be one, but if you have on average uh, there's say three uh, uh, layers of leaves covering that area, then your leaf area index would be three. Leaf area index is a unitless number and also um, basically shows how much um, trees are, you know, basically providing multiple layers and therefore uh, you are, you have a um, higher volume of green overall. Uh, there are a few key terms in or rainfall uh, interception model. Uh, the precipitation itself, so that's the overall precipitation that you have. Uh, some of that water sticks to the uh, leaves and that's we call it interception. Uh, some of that uh, just falls through because it doesn't hit any tree, any leaf, so that you can call it fall, um, fall through. Um, uh, is that correct? I think I think so. Um, and then some. Uh, the other thing is um, trees also at some point get saturated, and when they are saturated, you know, rain starts uh, basically dripping, um, and that's another uh, concept that we need here, which is the saturation level. What is the saturation level or storage level? Also, you can call it. Uh, precipitation storage. Um, all of that we used, uh, this is study that is basically the um, the theories, let's say, or the method for i3 um, um, software that many people use and you are probably familiar with. Um, so they basically use the same uh, relationship and we use that uh, relationship as or um, base um, equation. Uh, for that, you know, there are a few constants that we use. For example, SL is a specific leaf storage of water, which is just tiny for, of course, uh, when you are thinking about a leaf. Um, but then all of that, uh, I have the equation here, but if you need more details, of course, uh, you can go to this uh, study by Hirabayashi at, um, that they've done um, in 2013, and uh, you can see how they come together in an equation. Here is the model diagram again. I, again, I want you to understand the general process here rather than the details, but that is, uh, we have some input, input layers on left, and then uh, we have the process here on right. Uh, we get some of that data, we uh, define your ecosystem accounting area, which is basically your boundary of that city. And then uh, you find the weather station within, uh, around that you know, ecosystem accounting area or close to that area. And then you get the storm event, daily storm events. Um, so basically we are using an individual storm event um, for that city and um, overall if because we downloaded all those data you can have all those storm events and the size of those storm events for example how many millimeters uh, was that the precipitation uh, for each of those stations you get all daily rainfall events uh, for each cell you get the tree cover area for each cell these cells are 30 meter by 30 meter again um, for each cell, you get the leaf area index values um, uh, from Copernicus um, data, the European satellite, the European project. Um, and for each of those cells, you calculate the maximum storage capacity using tree cover and leaf area index. So basically, we want to know how much water can stick to trees in that cell. And that's the maximum storage capacity or saturation level. Um, and then we use a matrix multiplication function to uh, basically put together the, the individual storm events and the cells uh, and we calculate how much um, 
basically into rainfall interception you would have in that cell for that specific storm. If the storm was larger than saturation rate, then we just we say the saturation the interception would be uh, the maximum storage. So basically for every storm we want to know how much of that storm is sticking to trees and how much of that is just going to uh, to the ground as uh, runoff. Uh, for for cities, we use a data set that um, tells us whether they have combined sewer overflow system or not. Uh, and that's an important piece here because if you have a combined system, uh, you are processing water in your water treatment plants. Um, so therefore, the storm uh, runoff goes to that system and you have to process it. If you avoid uh, runoff in those systems, if you avoid water uh, to go to that system, then you are basically, you will have less water to process. And that's basically the benefit here that you can capitalize. Uh, and, and we use this relationship for um, basically using 25% as a percentage of interception above impervious surfaces. Um, you, if you have high resolution data, you might be able to get the accurate number for that. But here we are, you know, using um, 30 meter data, which is not great for that purpose. And then value of intercepted rainfall was about $2.58 uh, per cubic meter of water. Overall, we aggregated that number. And here is the results for the rainfall interception. Again, we did that for 2011 and 2016. And you notice here that in 2011, we had higher value uh, for um, 134 million uh, compared to 425. The reason that 2011 uh, was higher is because that year, the storm pattern was in a way that trees had more benefit. Because if, you're, uh, if you have many, um, more frequent storms, but those storms are smaller, then you will have more rainfall interception. Rather than if you have one big storm, then you really get a fraction of that, and then you hit to the graduation, uh, the um, storage capacity, and then you stop, right? So because of that, here uh, we, uh, you, that number is specific to that year because of those storms at that area and that geography. And that's the beauty of this model because it is specific to the city and is specific to the time. We aggregated those numbers for cities with CSO and cities without CSO. So those are the values that you can see. Again, those um, areas that have larger trees overall and higher tree canopy cover, they get a more benefit compared to cities in, uh, you know, in Western side of the country. Uh, these numbers, again, don't want to give you a headache with a lot of number here, but um, we can see the value of energy saving and the value of rainfall interception for each of those cities. And because we used error propagation and uncertainty of the models, uh, we were able to provide a lower confidence interval, an upper confidence interval. Um, and that gives you a range of what this value is and, and how reliable this value is. That's another um, you know, contribution of this project um, because you know, it, it is important to understand the, what the uncertainty is. Uh, eventually, all those numbers and values were uh, structured um, in basically the accounting tables. In accounting tables, you need supply table and you need use tables. The supply table tells you how much each, each of those ecosystem types are contributing to this value. Um, in, in this case, we use land uh, cover, national land cover data um, as a proxy for ecosystem types. And then we aggregated those values. So we can tell you how much of that uh, value is capitalized, for example, in urban areas, how much of that value is capitalized in, you know, for example, you know, uh, you know in, the, in, in non-urban areas, let's say. And uh, for, our, for the model that we developed, for example, urban heat mitigation, that might not be very uh, 
relevant because we used urban areas and buildings as a, a proxy uh, for where the value can be capitalized. Uh, but for rainfall interception, uh, it, it makes sense uh, in even non-urban areas. This is the use table. The use table basically tells you which which industry section is using um, or getting ben that benefit. Um, and uh, again, for or rainfall, it is clear that the wastewater treatment section is getting that benefit. But for urban heat, uh, because the buildings are really using that um, service, they could be any, uh, they could have any use. They could have uh, basically residential use or commercial use. And we use national land cover land use, sorry, national land use data uh, for this uh, purpose. Overall, or um, we use, we were able to basically use um, two models to um, estimate the values of trees. Um, and we use some of the physical model uh, for this purpose. So basically this, this bridges the physical modeling and uh, ecosystem accounting, uh, simplifying assumptions are very inevitable. Uh, some people say, why you use this value? Why you use that value? Eventually, if you want to run the model at national level, you have to come up with some simplification. Uh, confidence intervals and providing uncertainty was another key contribution in this project, uh, which you know gives some basically credibility because you know that your models are not very accurate. You have you are using some assumptions, so if you are propagating all of that error, you are able to provide some uncertainty level here for the users. Um, also, we were able to use accounting framework. Um, in this project and um, or codes uh, are living in public repositories and we are uh, working on um, creating some uh, platforms that these models can be used and run um, for multiple cities. Um, so those, this project is still an ongoing project for us. Uh, with that, I want to say thank you, and uh, we can go back to Amber and maybe questions and answers. Thank you so much. So thank you so much, Mindy, for that fantastic presentation um, and examples of the, the value of heat mitigation, rainfall interception in these regions. So to summarize the session, we highlighted multiple projects from around the world that really focused on valuing ecosystem services, of which the remote sensing piece is a major component. There is a need for continued use of these data alongside other forms of data for continued benefits of ecosystems to people and the protection of these ecosystems for the sustainable health of the planet. So I hope you enjoyed this training series. Um, it was really great to have all of our guest speakers with us. Um, it was the first time we've ever trained on a topic like ecosystem services. So hopefully it was a nice introduction to the concept um, along with some examples for you. Um, we really enjoyed having you all with us um, and providing this training. Just as a reminder, here um, is the contact information for myself and my colleague Juan. Um, and then again, you can find all the information about the training, including um, downloading the materials, the recordings of these sessions, as well as the link to the homework, all on the training website here. Um, as I've mentioned in the previous sessions, you can stay connected with us, follow us on Twitter. Um, you can learn about upcoming trainings. We have a variety of trainings in many different application areas. So do come back to the website, follow us, um, stay connected with the upcoming trainings. You can also check out our sister programs, Develop and Severe, um, at the NASA Applied Sciences website as well. Um, so thank you all again. We will now move into the question and answer session of this training. So thank you all. So um, my colleagues have pulled up the document here, 
and we will get to these questions now. Um, so the first question asks, how could I improve the accuracy percentage of the classification since it was at 83%? Um, so there are a variety of ways that you can improve the accuracy of your map. Um, you could include more ground-based data if you have them. Um, in order to essentially train the remote sensing data to understand what land cover classification you are um, looking at. Um, you could also include other data layers. Um, so you could, for example, include a Landsat map alongside um, a digital elevation model. And oftentimes that will improve the accuracy of your map as it incorporates topography into the analysis and uses that as um, a feature for identifying which land cover class um, you have for that region. Um, you can do those types of analysis in R, Google Earth Engine, and other software. Um, you could also try different land cover classification algorithms. Um, so we mentioned random forest, and there are others out there that you could um, investigate and take a look at as well. Um, I will say that the ground-based information is really the best a way to improve your accuracy. However, it's often the most difficult to get. Okay, um, so for question two, do the seasons affect the nature of the results? Is there a specific date and criteria for estimating biodiversity in the area? Um, so the best answer I can give is it depends. Um, in regions that have clear vegetation, green up and senescence, such as a mid-latitude temperate forest, there will be a clear change in the vegetation signature. Um, so you could use NDVI to highlight the, um, the, ND, the changes in NDVI values in the summer versus um, in the, the winter. Um, so as it relates then to species and biodiversity, um, it also depends on the species of interest and in, in the species you're mapping. So some species migrate based on um, changes in um, phenology in their associated landscape and vegetation. Um, and so this will just really depend on what your que the questions you're asking and your species of interest. Um, we have a couple previous RSET trainings that talk about um, phenology and species distribution modeling in more depth that we've also listed there for question two. Okay. Question three, why does the extent of the ecosystem need 22 classes in one map? Will this cause an overlap in map one? So I'm assuming this uh, relates to the, um, the Conservation International and NASA example. And so um, the, the research team had likely a specific region, reason for including those 22 classes. Those might be associated with different species, which could be used to estimate biodiversity, or for different types of agriculture where products might be evaluated for economic production. Um, the discrete types of land cover classes might also be used for identifying things like the contribution of carbon sequestration in different ecosystems. So the final uh, map was the combination of the first two maps, the land use land cover and the ecosystem extent. Um, and then those classes were um, base, basically likely chosen by the team, as I mentioned. There are other standardized approaches to land cover classification, and our guest speaker Ken mentioned this last time. And those are um, that work is largely being done by the UNFAO, which works on land cover classification systems and land cover um, um, the land cover meta language there as well. And so this was mentioned um, during our last session too. Okay, so question four. Regarding the Ganda report, a lack of ground level spatial and temporal bushmeat hunting data that is not taken into account in this type of analysis seems to discredit the utility of this type of report. Your thoughts? Um, so I will say it's always valuable to have ground-based data. I mentioned that in the first question especially when creating land cover classifications as this can help improve your accuracy. Um, I will say that without the bushmeat data, it might be difficult to estimate that particular value um, of that service to the country. However, the um, team was evaluating many other ecosystem services 
um, such as things like identifying ecosystem degradation, conservation areas for tourism. And so um, really, you know, I think the, um, those are really important aspects of the, the valuation study as well. And so, you know, large in part when um, these uh, studies are done and the, the maps are created, it really is a function of how much data you have available and the questions you, you can ask with those data that you're working with. Okay, so I will move on to question five. How can hyperspectral and SAR data be useful for evaluation of ecological services in a protected area using the INVEST model? And I will say I'm not um, an expert on using in INVEST. And I can certainly um, forward the question on to our guest speaker, Becky Chaplin Kramer, who was with us last week. But I will say that hyperspectral and SAR data can, can be useful for creating more detailed land cover classification maps. So you might be able to identify different vegetation species with a forest, for example, um, with hyperspectral data. The star data is really useful for identifying things like canopy cover, forest density, tree height. Um, so those additional data could provide more information on the ecosystem health and even carbon sequestration. So depending on what you are um, valuing in the invest model, those types of in inputs could be useful. Okay, question six. How difficult is it to differentiate classes of perennial and plantation forest in Indonesia? Um, I will say I've never conducted this analysis myself, um, but I would imagine that it depends on the structure and the vegetation type of the perennial versus the plantation forest. So if there are um, dominant species in the ecosystem that have a particular spectral signature or a particular um, leaf area index, um, as Vidi was mentioning with some of their work, then it, it might be, um, you might be able to differentiate between those um, types of ecosystems pretty clearly. Um, also, if you have additional data like hyperspectral data or SAR data, as I just mentioned, that might be useful in um, specifying those different classes. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it also depends on um, the structure of the plantation forest versus the perennial forest. I, I imagine that the plantation forests are likely much more uniform in their planting and less dense um, than you would see in a perennial forest. So using those features might help you identify um, how to differentiate those in a land cover classification map. Okay. So question seven asks, are there differences between land cover map classification before 2005 and then after 2005 for Uganda? And um, what's important in situations like that? So I will say that, um, and I pulled much of this from the report that we linked in the presentation, but the, one of the key ecosystem changes were substantial reductions in the extent of the natural ecosystems, particularly for forests moist savanna and moist savanna um, ecosystems. So the drivers for those would include things like changes due to farming and plantation use um, with up to three to four million hectares um, that are subject to change. So those are significant because um, they might not be able to support the delivery of those uh, identified services. Um, in a sustainable manner into the future. So that's um, something to consider um, when identifying these changes to land cover and potential degradation of the ecosystems and um, what it would take for them to uh, be unable to provide the ecosystem service um, identified. Okay, so question eight asks, in the value ecosystem services, are the valuations corrected for sustainable practices? For example, um, overfishing at high value, fishing can be obtained, and are those um, corrected for um, providing the service at the sustainable level? And I think the answer here is, again, it depends on how the economic valuation is conducted. Um, there are many studies, for example, with the fisheries example, um, that capture the current catch and associated values, um, regardless of if the practices are sustainable into the future. But there has been a lot of work 
um, focused on approaches that encourage sustainable behaviors. So these are things like ecosystem-based fisheries management. And I've provided a link to a paper that reviews some of those um, market-based instruments for increasing sustainability. It's a good question. Um, question nine, what kind of vegetation class mapping is currently powerful enough for evaluating ecosystem service with remote sensing? So I'm not sure I fully understand the question. We, we gave a lot of examples of the different types of um, data to be used and um, types of land cover maps that can be created. Um, but I will say that it really depends on the ecosystem of interest and what you're hoping to evaluate with your analysis. So I gave the example here of if mangroves are economically important, you probably want to ensure you're accurately mapping that type of land cover. And so that might necessitate the use of data like optical and SAR data in tandem with ground-based information. Okay, uh, moving on to question 10. Um, uh, amazing effort for the coral reef, uh, for coastal protection. Can we have the contact information of the researchers? So yeah, with, um, with all of the examples I provided, those were based on um, papers or research that had been done um, by others. So we've included the link here to um, four different papers that were mentioned in that um, highlight where you could get more information about the authors and um, the analysis itself. Okay, so moving on to question 11, and I think some of these now are um, for our guest speaker, Mehdi. So question 11 asks, how is the urban heat model different than what iTree does? Mehdi, would you like to respond? Uh, sure, uh, thank you so much, Amber. Um, you know, we need to understand the logic and the way I3 works. I3 basically um, tends to provide an estimation for, for example, a tree um, or a tree cover patch in urban areas. And um, so those uh, values are estimated based on some models that they ran. And, and then when you have a map of trees uh, for an urban area, those estimations are aggregated. The way our model works, it's slightly different. So we bring more variables into this, uh, including land cover, building footprint coverage, and also uh, surface temperature. And uh, the model, basically, every time that you run it, the model takes those variables and estimates the uh, specific, especially explicit, um, data for that city, for that cell. So it is not an estimation, overall estimation, it's an estimation for that specific cell. So that's one of the differences. Um, again, I'm not very uh, fluent on I3 uh, urban heat model. Um, that's my overall understanding of um, I3. Okay, great. Thank you, Mehdi. Sure, I can, um, I can go through the, the other questions. Um, the second perfect. question about the water bodies. Uh, yes, water it has a heat mitigation impact, um, but also has complex, um, you know, ethics because water also is a great storage for heat. At night, water bodies are actually warmer than um, other, you know, kind of impervious landscape, for example. So we bring a lot more um, complexity here. So, um, and also when you want to pay, you know, bring the impact of water to also bring the impact of wind because wind and water work together. And that makes the model very complex. Um, and a complex model will need more time to run um, and will need, uh, more computation capacity. One of the main um, goals in um, our project was having a manageable model that you can run it in a few hours and uh, it works uh, for a national level estimation. Uh, but if you are working on a small area, then I think that makes sense to bring more complexities such as water, wind, uh, overall, um, I would say holistic um, ecosystem 
uh, ecosystem, um, sorry, microclimate simulation. So uh, that's the reason that we didn't have water bodies because of just basically simplification. Question number three, 13 is about um, uh, three species um, and whether uh, having that as a data point would help for the interfall, um, interception, rainfall interception model. Yes. Uh, if you have three species data, then you can have a good estimation of leaf area index for that tree. And also, not only the leaves, you can also have a good estimation of the trunk um, and tree trunk um, storage because also that for winter time specifically, um, that would be very helpful. Uh, but that data is not available nationally uh, for the US. Um, and that means um, you need to have some um, rough estimation of the leaf area index. And that's why we use the Copernicus uh, data set for uh, leaf area index that has 300 meter resolution. Um, if you have better data, I would say you will have a better model, but that was not the case uh, in the US um, urban account project. Question number 14 is uh, based on the spatial, uh, spatial temporal analysis and whether we can predict um, future ecosystem service valuation. Yes, or models have predictive power because they are regressions. And regression in regressions, if you change your input, you can see how your output changes. Um, and in this case, for example, if you have an estimation, a future estimation of surface temperature or tree cover, um, and the way these work together, then yes, you can um, predict how much trees would benefit you in the future. In terms of rainfall interception, if you can um, predict the storm pattern, for example, you might, instead of frequent um, smaller storms, you may you may have um, uh, less frequent storms, but larger storms. So that would affect the rainfall interception um, benefits. That's something you want to consider. If you have the input for that model, then yes, you can predict the future. Question number 15, I think, is related to the Uganda project. Okay. Maybe I can also answer question 16. Um, they asked for the resources and details about these models, which is available in the paper that we published in 2021. Um, I guess these were the questions for me. Great, thank you, Mehdi. And um, we really appreciate those answers. And for question 15, um, was water quality data included in the Ugandan ecosystem accounting example? I'm not sure offhand, so I will um, take a look at that um, and get back to you. I can also provide you with the report um, created by that research team as well. Um, so that's something we'd have to look into for you. And as with that question and any of the remaining questions that we have here that we were unable to get to during our time together, we will take a look at those and answer the best we can um, via the via text and take a look at this document and get it all cleaned up and put onto the RSET website for you all to use as a reference later on um, as, as well. Um, so with that, I'll end the session for today. And I just wanna say thank you again uh, for being with us. Uh, you will be getting a um, link to a survey that we uh, really do encourage you to take um, it provides us with feedback about this training as well as um, advice for future trainings if there are other topics you'd like to see in the future. And we really do take those surveys into account. Um, and the, also the other thing I wanted to mention was the homework, the link to the homework is now available on the course website. It is a Google form that you would need to complete within two weeks in order to receive that certificate of completion. Um, and uh, then you give us about two or three months before you receive that certificate. 
as we get all of those out to everyone. So I want to thank Mitty again for being with us. We really appreciate your time and your expertise that you provided to today's session. Um, and then thank you all again for being with us. And um, use the course website as a reference for any of the materials from this entire training series. Feel free to email myself or my colleague Juan with future questions. And um, do please take care. Thank you.